Good morning, everyone. Great to see you. Look at all the smiles around the room. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and you're smiling with your eyes. That's, uh, <clears throat> that's what's important. And uh, you might think it's weird for me to be uh, wearing this mask if you haven't seen me uh, preach in this mask before. And uh, Amanda and I had actually talked about uh, getting me a, a Darth Vader mask to have for church. Uh, which I was all for until I saw how much it cost, so I ended up just going with this one. But this one will do anyways. Uh, we're so glad that you're here. Uh, before we get into announcements or anything else, just want to go over the uh, safety precautions we have here. And, and some of the things are, are kind of difficult for us because we're back. Some of us are, uh, this is our first time back in the sanctuary. Uh, in many months and so it's it's going to be a little bit weird for us to not do what we want to do because what we want to do is rush over and hug someone we want to shake a hand uh, we want to be close to each other and we can't do that and that's why we have you spaced out a bit and uh, in the pews and uh, it's to to keep you safe in that way and there is no handshaking uh, no hugging unless of course your your family and you live together then we don't really care but uh, if uh, you are not in each other's social bubble then please keep your distance uh, we ask you to keep your mask on for the entire time of the service if for some reason you're having a panic attack you got to get the mask off uh, please exit the sanctuary go outside get some fresh air and uh, you can remove your mask there. Uh, we'd also ask that you would wait until you get out of the uh, building before you have any time uh, visiting with each other. Uh, it's probably a good idea to keep your mask on out there as well, but uh, that's up to you uh, what you do outside. But um, please wait until you do that. Uh, also, this is gonna, another one of the hard things is uh, we're going to ask you not to sing during the songs, except for the worship team. The worship team are going to be the only ones who are singing. And someone asked me before the service, well, why is that? Why are you saying no singing? And that's because singing is one of the most dangerous ways of spreading the virus. It not only um, uh, makes it go farther, it actually turns it into an aerosol. So it's not just in liquid form, but it's in a kind of an air form and it is really easy to spread. A lot of the uh, areas that uh, have had outbreaks have been through churches where they were singing and especially choir practices. Those were things that were very dangerous. So we want to avoid that. That doesn't mean that we're not gonna ever sing again. That's not the case. Uh, we will indeed have singing, but uh, it's going to be a while yet before that happens. Um, what else do we have here? Uh, we're not going to be passing around the offering plate, but there is an offering plate at the back. And if you have brought your offering, you're welcome to do that, uh, to place it in there on your way out of the building. And uh, we also are not going to be uh, passing around a mic or anything for prayer. We're going to try to avoid uh, touching the same services as much as possible. So I think that that's most of what we need to know right now for safety precautions. Um, we have a few announcements to uh, bring to your attention. We are continuing our two-ton challenge and it's really exciting. We had to cancel our one-ton challenge and move to a two-ton challenge because we were getting so much food and that's, that's great. Now with our new, our new goal, we're actually at 66% of our goal, which is very exciting. So you're welcome to bring food. You can bring it on Sundays and the uh, barrel is at the back. So you walk right by it when you come into the sanctuary. Uh, also, you can come by the church office uh, Wednesday to Friday, 9.30 to 11.30, and you can bring in the, uh, the food or uh, cash donation, whatever it is that you would like to do. You can bring that at that time. Uh, also, there's been requests for some Bible studies, maybe by Zoom, and we will look at what we can do for that. So be watching for announcements. Oh, yes, I know there was one other thing that I wanted to mention. You notice that we didn't hand out any bulletins because, again, we're trying to keep uh, things as safe as possible. But there is a bulletin. The bulletin is online. 
So if you uh, want to, you're welcome to print it off. You just go to our church website, look for bulletin, click on that, and it'll have the week's bulletin. Or if you have a phone, like I, on my phone, I can actually bring it up, and I have the, the full bulletin right there on my phone that I can uh, look at it. And if you want, we do have Wi-Fi in the, uh, in the sanctuary here. So uh, it's uh, QSBC Guest is the one that you would be using. And the password is welcome with a capital W and an exclamation mark on the end. So that's welcome with a capital W exclamation mark on the end. And you're welcome to use that and to go to our church website and find uh, the bulletin. And uh, I think that that's what I have for announcements. And I'm going to turn it over to Amanda. For those of you who have been watching online, you will have known that last weekend I participated in Canadian Baptist Ministries' um, active admission, and I was raising funds for latrines in El Salvador. And I'd like to thank those of you who contributed to that. I was able to walk and bike a mixture of both over the weekend, last weekend, of 15 kilometers. And together we raised $925 for the treatings in El Salvador. So I am so thankful for your generosity and your continuing uh, efforts for mission here. I'd like to start this morning by reading a song, and I would invite you into just a moment of silence before I begin. Psalm 40. I put all my hope in the Lord. He leaned down to me. He listened to my cry for help. He lifted me out of the pit of death, out of the mud and filth, and set my feet on a solid rock. He steadied my legs. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise for our God. Many people will learn of this and be amazed. They will put their trust in the Lord. Those who put their trust in the Lord who pay no attention to the proud or to those who follow lies are truly happy. You, Lord my God, you've done so many things. Your wonderful deeds and your plans for us, no one can compare with you. If I were to proclaim and talk about all of them, they would be too numerous to count. You don't relish sacrifices or offerings. You don't require entirely burned offerings or compensation offerings, but you have given me ears. So I said, here I come. I am inscribed in the written scroll. I want to do your will, my God. Your instruction is deep within me. I've told the good news of your righteousness in the great assembly. I didn't hold anything back, as you know well, Lord. I didn't keep your righteousness only to myself. I declared your faithfulness and your salvation. I didn't hide your loyal love and trustworthiness from the great assembly. So now you, Lord, don't hold back any of your compassion from me. Let your loyal love and faithfulness always protect me, because countless evils surround me. My wrongdoings have caught up with me. I can't see a thing. There's more of them than the hairs on my head, and my courage leaves me. Favor me, Lord, and deliver me. Lord, come quickly and help me. Let those who seek my life, who want me dead, be disgraced and be put to shame. And let those who want to do me harm be thoroughly frustrated and humiliated. Let those who say to me, yes, oh yes, be destroyed by their shame. But let all who seek you celebrate and rejoice in you. Let those who love your salvation always say the Lord is great. But me, I'm weak and needy. Let my Lord think of me. You are my help and my rescuer. My God, don't wait any longer.
Our call to worship this morning is going to sound an awful lot like an Easter call to worship, and that's because it is an Easter call to worship. You might be thinking, well, wait a minute, we can't do that. It's not Easter time. But if we were to travel back in time and talk to some early Christians and say, uh, you know what, uh, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus uh, once a year, they would be absolutely shocked because uh, they would be celebrating the resurrection of Jesus uh, at uh, every, every time they met, they would be doing that. The resurrection was not something to be held off just for one day a year. So I'm going to uh, lead you in this. I will say the words for leader and you can say the words for congregation. The world is full of turmoil and unrest. We want to help, but we don't know where to start. You prayed for the unity of your church, but we are not unified. We long to be a vibrant, healing community of faith. My heart is full of turmoil and unrest. I need your power inside of me. He is risen. God, we thank you for this time to worship you. Lord, as we listen to the worship team, as we sing within our hearts, we ask that you would be glorified in all that takes place. In Jesus' name, amen.
At this time, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. There are a couple of things I would like to alert you to. Uh, first is that I am going to begin this prayer uh, with a poem that's written by David White as a time uh, or as something that we can reflect on. Uh, I will also have a time when we can say the names or circumstances of things that are on our heart um, as a time out loud to join our hearts together and pray together. And then we will end our time of worship by saying the Lord's Prayer together, which will be up on the screen as well. This is not the age of information. This is not the age of information. Forget the news and the radio and the blurred screen. This is the time of loaves and fishes. People are hungry, and one good word is bread for a thousand. God, you are the God of miracles, and we thank you for the miracles that we notice every day. For rainbows and a baby's cry, for new friendships and established relationships, for the beauty of nature and the rumbling of the thunder. You are the creator of all these things. You have established our lives and have offered these things and opportunities for us to notice the way that you work in our lives. Forgive us for the times we've allowed ourselves to become so distracted that not only have we missed the miracle, but we've also taken credit for the things that you have orchestrated in our lives. For this we confess our sin, and we humbly ask for your forgiveness. Help us to do better, for we do the things we know are wrong and do them anyway. And we long to do the right things, but end up doing the opposite. Lord, we need your grace and your mercy. God, you are the one to whom we can run to when we need shelter. You are the one we trust will hold us when things get unsteady. We bring to you now the names and circumstances that are on our heart, the things that are on our mind and we bring them to you now. Surely. Around our world, people need you. Help us to be the hands and feet of you, Jesus, to know how to reach not only across the ocean, but in our own neighborhoods. Enable us to raise up into action and be your presence here on earth. May we one day hear that when you were naked, we clothed you, and that when you were hungry, we fed you. Help us to see in each and every person that we encounter your divine image and treat them with respect and love as we heard in the poem, God, this is not the time or the age of information. This is the time for loaves and fishes. God, we need you, and you've given us these beautiful words to pray, and so we pray them together now. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We have decided to present to you today called Key Names. Um, this is recorded by a group called the Musical Voice in the Peter Furrow and Steve Taylor. What I like about this song is that it talks about believers in different parts of the world in very different conditions. In places like the you Amazon know, jungle, African plains, Asia, as well as the persecuted church meeting in secretly underground, as well as Christians meeting in cathedrals. And I think we've had the privilege of experiencing what it's like for the persecuted church uh, having worship services at home worship services here, having some restrictions on our services, but God is more powerful in all our circumstances.
for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourself from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted this message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Paul mentioned that the online services will continue and they're going to be a bit different in that what our services are this, uh, this morning is what's going to be put on to our YouTube channel uh, rather than pre-recording the services as we had been doing. But we found that the online services were definitely meeting a need and there were uh, many people who uh, don't have the opportunity to come here, who have been tuning in. In fact, we got a, a very nice card from Chris in London, Ontario, who uh, somehow had found our services and uh, sent a card saying that he appreciated the services. So, hi Chris, I uh, hope you're watching. And also my son Logan, who lives in Kitchener, uh, he's been watching the services very regularly. And we've been, uh, we've seen some pictures uh, taken at the group home of him sitting by the computer watching the services. So hi Logan, great to, great to have you with us today. Um, what we're having this morning in terms of our message on Acts is actually the fourth part of our series on Acts, and I realize that some of you have not heard the, the messages, the first three messages, and those can be found on our website, on our YouTube channel, so you can find them there. Uh, if you do not have access to uh, the internet and you would like at least the printout of those sermons, let me know and I can get you those sermons so you, you know the, uh, the background of what has gone on. So let us, uh, let's have a word of prayer before we dig into God's word. God, we thank you for Peter's message that he preached on the day of Pentecost. The incredible story of Jesus that he shared and the response of the people. We pray that you would give us wisdom today, that the same spirit who spoke to those 2,000 years ago would speak to us now. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever had a recurring dream? That strange kind of dream that just appears over and over again. I don't mean just that you've had it once or twice, but it has appeared numerous times. And uh, it could be a really bizarre dream. Uh, usually it is something out of the ordinary, uh, but it just keeps coming back over and over again. I've had some of these dreams throughout my life, and usually they'll last sometimes for a number of years uh, before it moves on to another recurring dream. Actually, when I was a teenager, uh, I had this recurring dream that my teeth were falling out. Not just one, but I'd be sitting there, you know, maybe uh, eating a cookie or something like that, and like eight of my teeth would fall out in one sitting there. And it got to the point where it was happening so often that when the dream happened, I knew that I was dreaming, that I would be aware of it. I'm like, oh, not this dream again. And I'd be like, okay, well, I just got to get through this dream. And so I would be fully aware that I was dreaming at the time. Well, I haven't had that dream in a long time, but there is another recurring dream that I have. And in this dream, I am uh, either walking by or driving by uh, the house in Meryton that I grew up in. And as I'm going by, I look and in the front window, I can see my father uh, sitting in his chair, the, the place where he usually was, 
uh, looking out the window and he would like wave at me and I would stop and go in. Now, what, why this is strange, it's not strange that I would be walking by there because I, I do actually drive, I don't walk by it, but I, every once in a while I'll drive by the old house just to see uh, what's happening. But uh, what is strange about it is that my father died um, over 15 years ago and my mother died um, uh, just over 10 years ago. And so it would be really strange to, to see them. But in this dream, uh, they you know, wave me in and I come in. And in the dream, I'm fully aware that they're supposed to be dead. And yet, there they are. There they are. They're talking to me. It's not like I've gone back in time. It's as if they never died. That's the, the, the sense that's going on. In fact, I, I'm afraid to say anything. I don't want to break the spell. I don't want to uh, prevent anything from happening. I just kind of talked myself into it. Well, I must have dreamed that they died because here they are. And so I have a really nice visit with them. And then I wake up. Well, of course, it is just a dream. But the disciples, they had experienced the death of the most important person in their life, uh, Jesus of Nazareth. He died. They knew that he died. They, no one survives a Roman cross. Uh, there were witnesses to the actual death. And yet, there were those who claimed to have seen him alive. But this wasn't a dream. He really was there. It wasn't just one or two people who were missing him and their subconscious was speaking to them. Rather, over 500 people saw him during those 40 days between his resurrection and his ascension. The resurrection of Jesus is essential, and that's what we're going to be looking at as we look at this portion of Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. And it's important for us to remember that this is a part of the same sermon that he was preaching last week as we looked uh, he was there in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost with other followers of Jesus. There were other people from all over the Roman Empire who were Jewish, but who were in Jerusalem visiting for the festival. The Holy Spirit had been poured out. Peter identified this with the prophecy of Jewel. And it's important to remember in that prophecy of Jewel, it talks about being in the last days and so there was a real eschatological, that is like an end times kind of feel to that jewel prophecy. And I want you to be thinking about that. Just hold on to that thought about uh, this connection with the end times. And so they, uh, they saw that the Holy Spirit had come out and Peter had uh, preached this message about what was happening. But he didn't want to just explain what was happening. He also wanted to explain what they were supposed to do. And that prophecy in Jewel has the phrase, all those uh, who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Well, it'd be really nice if, uh, if Peter explained what that meant. Instead of just saying, you know, this is what you have to do, call on the name of the Lord. Uh, what does that mean? What does that look like? And one of the things that's kind of interesting in the Old Testament, in Joel's original prophecy, uh, that's referring to Yahweh, uh, the, the name of God that we sometimes use as Jehovah. But the name of the Lord, in the way that Peter uses it here, is as Jesus, those who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus. And so Peter goes on to preach who this Jesus is. And he says that Jesus performed great miracles. Well, that by itself was not necessarily enough to make someone a follower of Jesus. There were other people, other teachers who seemed to have uh, committed or who had performed miracles. In fact, there were later Jewish traditions who did not deny that Jesus had performed miracles, but they believed that he did it by black magic. And then Peter goes on to talk about the death of Jesus. And I need to be very clear in this because he, he pins some blame on the death of Jesus to the people who he's talking to. And all too often people have looked at this and saw this 
as reason to blame the Jewish people for the death of Jesus and use references like Christ killers and, and so on. And that has happened throughout history, and yet that's not appropriate because we need to remember that all of the followers of Jesus at this time, including Peter, were Jewish. And so when he's saying this, he's referring to some people who were in the crowd because when we go back to the Passion narrative, we saw that there were people in the crowd who were yelling, crucify him, crucify him. It wasn't the Jewish race that called for the crucifixion of Jesus, but there were some people who were there in Jerusalem who had done that. So he speaks of the death of Jesus on the cross, but that too by itself was not enough to make someone a follower of Jesus. Can you imagine going up to someone and saying, you know, you really need to follow our teacher. He is the great Messiah. And you respond by saying, oh, that's interesting. So, so what did he do? Oh, he died on a cross. Yeah, he died this really painful death. You've got to follow him. He's great. And people would be like, what? what? Doesn't that mean that he failed? Like, that's defeat. That's what dying on the cross means, you, that you weren't who you say you were. That's how people would respond. And so the death by itself was not enough. Then Peter goes on to speak of the resurrection. And this is the, the key to his argument. In fact, this was the core of the Christian message. As we go through the book of Acts, we will see that the focus always was on the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, sometimes they didn't even talk about the cross. They only talked about the resurrection. And I love what Peter says in here. He talks about how it was impossible that death would be able to hold on to Jesus. It was impossible that that happened, it, meaning that the resurrection was inevitable. From a human perspective, when people saw Jesus dying on the cross, they would say, oh, you know, the, he has really lost it now. Like, there is no way that he is coming back here. This is looking as grim as it possibly can. And yet, even at that moment, it was impossible for death to hold on to Jesus. The resurrection had to happen. Now, remember I said that that prophecy of Joel had that kind of end times feel to it? Well, the Jews understood the resurrection, and they saw the resurrection not as someone returning back to life the way Lazarus had uh, come back to life or some of the other people that Jesus had raised, because all those people got old and died again. But Jesus received a resurrection body, and the Jewish people believed in that, but they believed that it happened, it would happen in the end times. That's when that would take place. And so this actually is a sign for us, both the pouring out of the Spirit and the resurrection of Jesus, that the end times have come. So people will say to me sometimes, you know, do you, Steve, do you believe that we're in the end times? And I'll say, yes, we are definitely in the end times. However, the end times have been going on now for about 2,000 years. So I can't get any more specific than that. But yes, we are in this, this stage of salvation history. And we see the response to this. And the response is not just to hearing about miracles or hearing about the death, but hearing about the resurrection. 3,000 people responded by repenting and being baptized. Now, I got to say, you know, as, a, as someone who preaches for a living, considering this was uh, Peter's first sermon that he ever preached, 3,000 people getting baptized, not bad, not bad for a beginner, you know, yeah, yeah, it was pretty good. So that's what happened in the time of uh, Peter and those early disciples. But what does it mean for us? What does all of this mean for us, this focus on the resurrection of Jesus. Well, what it means is we get this one holiday uh, every year. We're going to have a one Sunday every year where we're going to sing uh, some wonderful Easter hymns, uh, some of my favorites that talk about the resurrection of Jesus, and we'll have a special sermon about the resurrection of Jesus, and we'll do that once a year. That's the impact that's going to have on us. Well, maybe it's going to have more of an impact. Uh, the resurrection should as it was back then, still be the core of our message. That's what it's supposed to be. You know, there were many times that when I would ask people, what is the gospel? And people would say, oh, I can tell you what the gospel is. The gospel is that Jesus died on the cross so that you can go to heaven. That's the gospel. And 
it is true that Jesus died on the cross, and it is true that by faith we will go to heaven. But just saying that Jesus died on the cross is not the full gospel. You need to have the resurrection. The resurrection is not just a tag on because, you know, the cross is kind of depressing. It's kind of sad to be thinking about Jesus dead. So, you know, we'll kind of cheer things up a bit with the resurrection. That's not the way it is. The resurrection is central to this. When we go through uh, the book of Acts, when we go through the letters of Paul, we see over and over again this emphasis on the resurrection, even to the exclusion of the cross. I'm not saying that the cross isn't important. Of course, the cross is vital. It is so important. But it is important because the resurrection took place as well. Now, I can't speak for you, but I can speak for myself in terms of why the resurrection is important. Because it is the resurrection of Jesus that is the foundation of my faith. There are a lot of things that confuse me. There are a lot of things that make me wonder. And yet I always go back to the crucifixion and the resurrection. When I look at church history and I see the terrible crimes, the murders, the tortures that were done in the name of the church, it is really hard. But Jesus rose from the dead. When I watch the news and I see pastors and other church leaders doing terrible things, uh, abusing and uh, stealing and cheating and committing adultery and, and doing all kinds of things that are so hypocritical, it is hard on my faith. But Jesus rose from the dead. There are times when I'm reading the Bible and I'm going through it and I'm like, I don't understand this. This is so bizarre. This is so strange. I don't know what to do with this passage here somewhere or another. But Jesus rose from the dead. I don't know why bad things happen to good people. I don't know why we can pray one simple thing and God seems to respond right away. And then we pray for something much more serious and God seems to be silent. But Jesus rose from the dead. I'm aware of my own weaknesses, of the ways that I fail, of the ways that even when I, I try to do good, that I'm filled with pride over how well I've done. And yet Jesus has risen from the dead. That is what gives us a firm foundation for our faith. That's what I hold on to. The core of the Christian message is that Jesus has been raised. Not just that he came back to life so that he could live out the rest of his life and, and do all the things that he didn't have a chance to do before. Rather, he experienced the true resurrection, receiving a resurrection body and ascending to heaven. The same thing that will happen to us one day when Jesus returns. This is the message of hope, the resurrection that death is defeated, that it was impossible for death to hold on to Jesus. That gives us hope. As a church, as we are facing what is going on with COVID-19 and all of the uncertainty, as we are trying to get back to normal, but we don't know what normal looks like, we don't know what church looks like, uh, we don't know if there's gonna be a second wave, we don't know if there's gonna be a vaccination, we don't know so many different things but Jesus rose from the dead. We can hold on to that. That is hope for the church. We also can have hope for ourselves as individuals. There's so much that we don't understand in our own lives, so many areas that we struggle with, and yet Jesus rose from the dead. This isn't just a symbol, it's not an image, it's not just a beautiful story, it's history. People witnessed it. It actually happened, and, and because of that, we can have hope and assurance. Let us pray. God, we thank you that Jesus walked out of that empty tomb, that death was not able to hold him. In fact, it was never a fair fight. Jesus is always going to win. We thank you that because of that, we share in that hope in all of the uncertainty of life and faith 
and everything else that goes on, Jesus rose from the dead, and we can move forward doing the next right thing because of that. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I let uh, Alan pick this, uh, this, all the songs for today, and I thought, you know what, I should probably pick the, the, the final song, because I'd like to, to have some kind of connection between the final song and my message, and yet when I looked at what Alan had picked for the final song, I thought, that's it, that's the perfect song that we need. And I kind of accused Alan of maybe reading my mind, but he assured me that he doesn't have that ability. Uh, but anyways, I appreciate that, and uh, God works in mysterious ways. So even though you can't sing the song, if you just listen to it, you read the words, I hope that you get the message. Before I pronounce the benediction, uh, just a final word of, uh, of how things are going to work. Uh, first of all, I just want to say you've done a great job on our first Sunday back. I'm so proud of you. Uh, as we do go, I would encourage that the people at the back uh, leave first, and so the, the back rows go and then moving on, it's sort of like what happens at a, at a funeral, but it's not a funeral. So uh, please do it that way and make your way out the doors on this side and you can visit with each other outside. Uh, let us pray. God, we thank you that you have been here with us. That you have been with us even when it has not been church the way we have wanted, the church that we have expected, 
the church that we have longed for over the past four months, but it is church, it is worship, and your Holy Spirit is here. The same Holy Spirit that was there on the day of Pentecost is here with us today. The same Jesus who rose from the grave back then is with us by the presence of the Spirit. May we go from this place in the power of the resurrection, seeing how you are bringing death uh, to defeat in every area. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.